Running out of water, many parts of the world are drying up at an alarming rate. What's being done to confront the crisis which affects at least a billion people? And what caused it in the first place? This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. We are facing one of the greatest global risks of our time, the shortage of water and the battle to secure supplies of the most vital life-giving commodities is political, environmental and economic. The UN says there's an abundance of fresh water, but that it's unevenly distributed around the world and under increasing pressure, such as in Cape Town an entire city of around 4 million South Africans running dry. Water scarcity is a growing issue. In the Gulf, countries such as Qatar and Bahrain desalinate seawater to provide drinking supplies. And more than 1 billion people in Asia rely on rivers and glaciers for drinking and irrigation. But glaciers that feed the rivers are shrinking or even disappearing altogether because of global warming. North African countries such as Algeria suffer extreme water shortages. And the political battle over damming the Nile has devastated many farmers in Egypt. Central and Latin America, on the other hand, have 60 times more fresh water than the Middle East and North Africa. But Americans living in drought-stricken US states, such as California, often have water restrictions, as Rob Reynolds reports from Los Angeles. An estimated 18 million people now live in the Los Angeles metropolitan area on land that was once largely arid. This sprawling city has thrived despite the lack of an obvious large source of water nearby. Los Angeles' history is tied with water. This place was able to grow and expand and become one of the largest metropolises in the world because we brought water here. The second phase of, I think, Los Angeles' growth now is going to be with a new normal with the expectation of less water over time and more people. How can we sustain economic progress and sustain life itself here in LA? LA's water comes in by aqueducts. From the San Joaquin River Delta to the north, the Sierra Nevada Mountains to the east, and Hoover Dam on the Colorado River, 400 kilometers away. But all three sources are in decline. We have the pressure of climate change, which has been reducing our winter snowpack over time. The snow is either not falling or it's melting too quickly in the early months and then we're dry in the summer months. The solutions to Los Angeles's water dilemma, according to its mayor, are conservation, recycling and better use of local sources of water. Conservation was proven effective in the recent multi-year drought when LA residents reduced water use dramatically. We have plenty of water in Los Angeles. It's whether we choose to use it efficiently and effectively. Recycling wastewater is another challenge. About 60% of our equivalent water usage every day, we treat, clean, and then wash out to the ocean. That means that we could have 60% more water if somehow that water came back to us. If we could just take that water, make sure, as many places do, that it is sanitary to drink, and then bring that to the homes that we have. Contrary to popular belief, it does rain in Southern California, but currently that rainwater goes to waste. It's one of the perverse things about LA is that we've engineered this incredible system that whenever one drop of rain drops outside of our city, we know how to grab it, take it, use it. But anything that actually drops inside our city, we quickly wash it out to the ocean instead of reusing it for ourselves. That's what we're changing and that will ensure life for you know centuries to come. Challenges that must be met to keep the city of angels from running dry. Rob Reynolds, Al Jazeera, Los Angeles. Well, let's now bring in our guests. Joining us from Cape Town, Kevin Winter, lecturer at the Environmental and Geographical Sciences Department, University of Cape Town. In London, David Techner is a chief freshwater advisor at WWF, that's the World Wildlife Fund. And in Norwich, via Skype, Mark Zetun, co-founder of the Water Security Research Centre. Very warm welcome to all three of you gentlemen. David Tick, now are we facing one of our largest global risks when it comes to water? 
Paint the picture for us. Yeah, I think that's a, a fair way of summarising it, Jane, and I, I liked your introductory piece as well. Water is one of those issues which, uh, unless it's in profound scarcity, if we're in the middle of a drought, or conversely sometimes if we're uh, experiencing floods, it's, it's an issue that quite often people don't think about. But, but somehow or another, every day, we, we all live at the water's edge. So it doesn't really matter how close you are to a, a, a river or, or a lake. Um, the water we need to, to generate the power that keeps our lights on, to, to irrigate the crops that feed us, to, to manufacture the stuff that we buy and use every day, and of course the water we use in our, in our homes. All of this water uh, comes from rivers, lakes or, or aquifers, uh, and those rivers, lakes and aquifers in many parts of the world are under increasing pressure. Um, partly because we're overusing them, partly because we're polluting them, and generally because we haven't really taken very good care of them in recent years. Throw in a bit of climate change, which makes rainfall and water supplies increasingly unpredictable. Uh, and it's pretty clear that the world is facing something of a crunch in terms of how it manages water. Kevin Winter, you nodding away there. I know that Cape Town is experiencing its own pain and misery when it comes to this. But from a, a bigger global point of view, how big an issue are we looking at at the moment? Well, I think I can really only speak for our region in particular because, uh, and, and the comment that David makes just now about we're all living on the edge uh, of water in lots of ways. And in our particular case, uh, it has been a prolonged drought and we're now going into our fourth year and very uncertain uh, what our winter rains are going to hold. So it's a massive issue, and here we are with a city uh, with its own history of apartheid and the implications of uh, a city that is struggling uh, with many other issues, uh, and water has never really been one of them. Uh, we've coped pretty well up until now, and we've had really good programs for water demand management um, over the years. And now suddenly the trigger has been has let off and set off rather, and we have a city which is uh, increasing in size, uh, and we've got climate change. Uh, so the realities of your introduction and, and what David just said are very real to us right now. And David also pointed out that it's something that we never really notice until we need it. Do you think that's one of the problems? I mean, look at the picture behind you, and you know in Cape Town it's water, water everywhere. Is that one of the problems? Yeah, I think uh, the... Uh, issue that we really have to look at here is improving our ability to manage water. And if we go back to where we were in 2015, roughly using about 230 litres per person per day, that's well above the global per capita usage, and we've now been pushed to use about 50 litres per person per day, and we've almost achieved that, which is remarkable, but in between, it says we must have been doing something that shows our inability to manage water effectively. Lots of waste, lots of uh, decline in our water as well. And let me just pick up when the other point was raised already, our inability to capture storm water and to use it effectively to recharge our aquifers. So we've learned a lot, and, and what's happened over the last three, two or three years is a readjustment of a management program that was focused on a particular area, mainly around water demand management and reliance on our dams uh, to supply us our water. And 98% of the city of Cape Town's water comes from dams, from surface dams. So that means you put in all your eggs into one basket and in a, as a climate resilient strategy, uh, that's one that's not going to uh, face, uh, it's going to certainly give us many challenges in the future. Um, so these are some of the things that the city is, is certainly having to deal with right now. It's a wake-up call. A wake-up call indeed, Mark Zatoun, from a global risk point of view and your experience. What are you seeing when it comes to water, the role it's playing at the moment and, and the impact of the scarcity? Well, the impact is felt very much locally, like your, your other interviewees had, have said. Uh, I look mainly at the Middle East and there, all across the Middle East, of course, um, but in very different ways in, in different places, the, the, the scarcity is felt in very acute or less acute ways. So, for instance, uh, the scarcity in Jordan, also man-made, not, I mean, let's not blame climate change or, uh, or God or Mother Nature. It's it's a dry part of the world. Jordan just doesn't have a lot of water resources to begin with. But if on top of that, 
you've got population influxes due to war from, you know, first originally from Palestine and the creation of the state of Israel and then from uh, Iraq and now Syria, then the pressure is that much greater on water resources that exist in Jordan that were already mm -hmm. scarce. At the same time, in Jordan and in other places around the around the Middle East, we're, we're, we're mismanaging water in the sense that we're growing, for instance, uh, crops in the desert with the, the little bit of water that we that exists in some of the places means that it should be used for its most valuable resource mainly for drinking water for people and not so much to grow crops that are then exported or that could be imp imported in the form which is what we call virtual water so if you have the option to import food rather than grow food then you can use the existing water that you have uh, for more valuable uh, um, reasons. Now, and that's not even to get into the transboundary element and all the water conflicts that are going on in the Middle East. Okay. Interesting that you talk about water conflicts. That's one of the things we're going to touch on because Kuwait is hosting the third Arab water conference to discuss issues in the Middle East. Leaders are discussing how to combat desertification, climate change, management failures and water theft. And they're talking about regional conflicts such as the Golan Heights as well as water shortages in the occupied Palestinian territories and southern Lebanon. Let me go back to you, Mark. I mean, how often is water used to push a political agenda? Well, it's, it's water is used all the time to, to promote politics, and water is politics. Water is used to achieve political or military objectives, increasingly in Iraq and in Syria. But to get back to the political objectives, then yeah, if you look at the Jordan River, for example, Israel's near total control over the transboundary Jordan River, which includes Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, and the Palestinians, uh, that control is being used not to share the water equitably, but to um, to displace one group of people, the Palestinians from the West Bank, for example, by denying them water, and then to lay down water pipes on the Israeli settlements and to encourage a new population to come and settle the land. So it's, water is used for population transfer and for ethnic cleansing in that case. David, I should imagine that you see politics at play all the time when it comes to water, considering how profitable it is, how much it's needed, and how well it can be used to squeeze or exploit people, get what you want. Yes, yes. I mean, I think Mark's right that, that the water is a profoundly political issue. It's also an issue that often is um, tackled within broader geopolitical contexts, particularly where there are transboundary issues. There are about 260, 270 odd rivers around the world which flow across national borders. And, uh, and whenever that happens, then uh, how those rivers are shared, how the benefits from those rivers are shared, that's always going to be slightly at the whim of broader political debates between countries. We see this, I mean, Mark, Mark has mentioned the Middle East a lot. Um, we see this in other parts of the world as well. WWF does quite a lot of work in the Mekong uh, region in Southeast Asia. The Mekong is uh, you know, one of the top 10 longest rivers in the world. It, it flows for about 4,000 kilometers across six countries from China down to Vietnam and Cambodia. Um, there's a lot of dam building going on uh, on the Mekong. A lot of that is to generate hydroelectricity. Uh, and it's a region which needs electricity for development. But the way in which the dams are being built um, is uh, perhaps not particularly sensible and could have profound consequences for the food security of the downstream countries, Cambodia and Vietnam. That's less to do with water use for, for growing food and, and irrigation, although there are elements of that. It's more to do with the fisheries uh, that live naturally in the river, uh, and which are a major source of protein for 60 million people living in the Mekong. Uh, you build the dams, that has major impacts on those fish populations, which begs the question, what are those 60 million people going to do for their protein sources? Uh, where are they going to get protein from? It's uh, such a different balance, a difficult are, balance think, to make. struggling excuse to me, answer that question. Yeah, excuse me, jumping in here, to get that balance, you know, man obviously wants to get involved, but when you've got them changing the course of rivers, interfering with Mother Nature disturbing that delicate eco-balance, it can only end in problems, can't it? 
Well, it can if you do it badly. Um, but one of the encouraging things is that among sort of technical water management experts around the world, there's been a, a real sort of flowering over the last 20, 25 years of, of innovation uh, in, in sort of governance approaches, in planning approaches, uh, in technical assessment approaches, which um, have enabled us to understand those potential trade-offs between, for example, building dams and, and impacts on downstream countries much, much better. Um, there, there are seldom perfect solutions, but quite often there are very good solutions. What we really need now is the politicians to be alive to those, uh, to be ready to be informed by those, to engage stakeholders in some of those discussions. And if we do that, then it, there's every reason why uh, that we could manage our rivers much better going forward. OK, and we're going to focus a little more on solutions later on, but I just want to come back to you, Kevin, and talk about possible politics at play in Cape Town and South Africa. Do you think the fact that the opposition party, the DA, was in control of the Western Cape, did this have a role? Did this impact on the government not wanting to release the resources that's needed? And, and if politics has such a stranglehold on such an important resource, how do you work around it? Well, South Africa's politics are in a very complicated space and the ability for national government uh, to align itself and, and to communicate more effectively with local authorities, particularly if there are local authorities with uh, opposition parties involved in running those cities, seems to have been uh, one of these uh, challenges that has delayed some of the decision making and the cooperation from uh, a national government to a local government uh, level. So they, they certainly have, I think, um, been awkward debates. It's, it's been slow in terms of timing. Uh, to turn that around on the other side is that cities, uh, large cities like the city of Cape Town, are going to have to learn to lead a lot faster. And national governments tend to follow rather than actually lead. So it, uh, it's appropriate for cities the size of Cape Town to be much more proactive rather than waiting uh, for either some pronouncements from p politicians at a national level or to bring very limited national budgets uh, to bear uh, on a crisis. And in the case of South Africa, we've had all nine of our provincial areas undergo severe droughts. So there isn't a lot of money left in the pot anyway. And, and therefore local cities, local governments have to do much more uh, to become uh, more resilient. They have to literally lead. Certainly we've got loads of politics within our own, own country when we look at this not only at a catchment level but also at a city level uh, where uh, in many ways day zero, the minimal amount of water that people have been living on uh, is something which people have been actively uh, engaged in and living for, for many decades. Uh, people living in informal uh, settlements in South Africa and in Cape Town and in low cost housing areas. Uh, water and access to that water and most of all water in terms of sanitation today we seem to be talking more about water supply, but we also need to be talking about water services and water sanitation and also drainage uh, that's associated with that as well. But politics abounds uh, in our country and, and, and it, it certainly uh, makes for some very tough uh, decisions that are based upon party politics at the expense of managing water effectively. Mark, any solutions that you can talk about in the Middle East region that are sustainable and that are easy to share with everybody who needs it and and cost effective yeah the silver bullet is what we're looking for but i yeah. agree with dave uh, there's no perfect solution there are some pretty good solutions based on best practice and what we've learned generally the you know using less water uh, is is a good idea and that means getting your agricultural practice under control which doesn't always mean more efficient agriculture but just means uh, growing the right kinds of crops in the right kinds of places and maybe importing crops rather than using your precious water resources. So that's one option. In ter terms of transboundary water conflicts, I draw your attention to two, the, the conflicts on the Nile uh, with the dam that Ethiopia is building uh, upstream on the Nile and the Tigris and Euphrates with the dam that Turkey is building on the Tigris and, and that are the many several dams that Iran is building on the tributaries to the Tigris, which all of which are going to have massive downstream impacts on Sudan and Egypt in the Niles case, and, and mainly on Iraq in the Tigris case. 
What do you do there? That's geopolitics writ large. The imperfect solution is to promote um, well, hydro diplomacy and the promotion of international water law. International water law has been codified uh, and is effective is in effect these days. And it talks about some quite reasonable principles like equitable and reasonable use, which suggests how the water or control of the flows should be used and should be divided. It's, it actually, the, the principle of equitable and reasonable use suggests that uh, the waters not be divided equally, but equitably according to the need and access to alternative sources and, and other reasonable factors that I think all countries should be uh, promoting and investigating and basing their transboundary water policies upon. Okay, David, so it seems that we need to look at water differently because there is no substitute for water, is there? And there's the same amount of water where you know, wherever it goes, where it goes, when it goes up, it's got to come down somewhere. So it's how we access it and utilize it better. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think there is the beginnings of a fundamental shift in the understanding and, and the basis of how we manage water. I think throughout much of the, uh, the 20th century, the emphasis was very much on engineering approaches, build dams, store water, supply it to people who need it. Uh, and there's a role for that going forward as well. But increasingly, we're seeing that that rivers and aquifers are, are now in overdraft. We're, we're taking too much water out of them. And so we can't just keep on supplying more and more and more uh, until the rivers and the aquifers completely run dry. We have to look at a, a range of different measures. Mark has mentioned some of the, the measures that need to happen at, at the sort of the, the big scale, if you like, the global scale using international water law and transboundary negotiations. There are a bunch of things that can happen at, at, a, at more local scales as well. So for instance, um, you know, we can plan how we allocate water much more robustly so that we're not living in, in hydrological overdraft, if you like. We're only taking as much out of the system as the system can afford. We can tackle pollution at source. That's uh, in working with companies, working with factories to try and make sure they have good pollution treatment uh, in on site and also working with farmers to make sure that they're taking good care of soil and not applying, applying too many fertilizers and, and pesticides. This is a global issue. We even see it here, here in the UK. Um, we can work with a whole range of stakeholders, including the public, to just try and raise awareness of, of how precious a resource water is uh, and also of the role that ordinary people can, can take through uh, better conservation of water in their homes, through contributing to citizen science, through raising political pressure. Uh, and importantly, I think we need to take uh, account of what's happening to the nature uh, of our rivers. I, I think it's an often forgotten dimension of the water security crisis that, that, that the wildlife that river, uh, lives in rivers and lakes and wetlands is declining precipitously at twice the rate we see of, uh, in, to, in the oceans uh, and in the tropical rainforests. Okay. If we really want a litmus test of whether we're managing rivers sustainably, stabilizing wildlife levels is, is a really good thing to look at. Kevin, so it's a no-brainer, and briefly, if you will, I mean, if we look after our water supplies, you can uh, raise a generation, can't you? You can uh, educate people far better. You can raise health san uh, standards, sanitation standards. Everybody benefits. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting discussion and uh, part of the work that we do. And just to come back to this, the, the conversation around downstream impacts of our water and our mismanagement of that, uh, one of the experiments and, and work we do at a fairly large scale right now, so not just experiments, but we're taking failed sanitation systems from our informal settlements and we're taking that water which is uh, coming down into a stream, uh, diverting that through large nature-based uh, processes uh, and these processes are able to clean up about 75% of the contamination of that water and we're using that water now safely uh, for edible, irrigating edible uh, uh, crops. So it's amazing what we can do and if we can clean up passively, effectively without a, a large investment of infrastructure and most of all not adding more chemicals to the problem, uh, we can start to improve, uh, as, as David saying just now, our wildlife uh, further downstream. Okay, let's so leave on that positive outlook. we are at the moment cleaning outlook. thousands of litres of water on a weekly in, basis, in and it's incredible uh, We're gonna have what to nature leave it there. can do. Kevin Winter, thank you very much. David Tickner and Mark Zetun. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting 
our website, aljazeera.com, for further discussion. Find out what you can do when it comes to this water crisis. You can go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Jane Dutton, and the rest of the team, goodbye for now.